Kalanji Changa. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you're known for, all those, all those sorts of things. Hmm. Uh, I'm a black man, first and foremost. Uh, an author, uh, filmmaker, podcast host, and I guess most known for being a community activist and organizer. All right, all right. Um, I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, been in Atlanta for 15 years and I've been working. All right. All right. So before we get into a little bit more about what it is that you do, um, tell me a little bit about growing up in Bridgeport. What's that like? You know, here in Connecticut, we think, you know, Kentucky like, but it doesn't seem like it's anything like right, that. Right. Yeah. So Bridgeport, Connecticut is uh, it's a small, dark space. It's a, um, it, it's a, it's, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in the south end of Bridgeport, which is, um, which was at that point a community full of different projects, apartment complexes, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, Connecticut, Bridgeport, where I'm from, and 45 minutes away from Harlem, you know, uh, maybe another 35 minutes away from the Bronx. Same TV, same radio, same crime, you know, uh, inner city. Mm -hmm. um, like most inner cities, you know, it has its challenges, you know, the, um, the difficult um, environment, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it's a place where I, I grip my teeth, you know, it's the place where, um, you know, where, where you have to fight to get out of. Right. Um, did you find yourself mixed up in the violence at all growing up? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in the '80s, so I grew up in the um, grew up during Reaganomics. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. The whole crack era. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I was a uh, I was the white sheep of the family. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Whatever, whatever. Um, you know, my pop said go left. I went right. He said do this. I was doing the opposite. But basically, you know, I got into the whole like many folks here in that area got into the whole pharmaceuticals business, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? The unlicensed mm -hmm. pharmaceutical business. And um, that took me on a, a journey that almost cost me, cost me a little of my freedom, but it almost cost me uh, 36 years of my life. You know, wow. So I was, um, found myself in a jam at age 17 and, um, you know, in the state of South Carolina, I moved down there. And, for the first time, you know, I began to understand what my father and my elders and so many others were speaking on when they were talking about racism and white supremacy and slavery and all that good stuff. And I understood at that particular point, it was almost like that Malcolm moment, mm -hmm. what it was about, what, uh, what America was about, and that America was, you know, um, euphemism for prison, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, it, it uh, Definitely, I came up in that era. You know, um, I wouldn't say I was proud of it, but I say that it was one of my greatest life life lessons. Would you say that that was absolutely life changing for you? Like took you from one path to another? Absolutely, I think that at that particular moment, I began to see life for what it was worth. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I began to uh, at that moment understand what what freedom and captivity was. Uh, and how, you know, I was playing into, and so many others played into the the game of, you know, of being entrapped, of being, you know, shuffled into this, this system of, uh, you know, this capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, so I absolutely, it was a, the greatest learning experience. Again, I don't, um, I, I can't say I regret it. I regret selling plantation poison. I regret uh, being on the wrong side of history because I, at the time, you know, when that whole drug game was in was full throttle, mm -hmm. we didn't know that we were actually destroying our people, right, right. trying to build ourselves up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like uh, Molly Yeshatella. He had a uh, a uh, piece on 
Dead Prince first album, he talked about the wolf, how wolves would, uh, you know, hunters would put blood on the blade and the wolf would lick the blade and they'd think he's, you know, actually eating something and he's really splitting his tongue and killing himself. And that's what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? We were byproducts of our own demise. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, again, I don't regret the experience of being locked up because I can speak on it. You know, and I understand, you know, what value we have here. Gotcha. Would it be fair to say that that experience kind of lit the fire as an activist in you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, funny thing is, I actually had a stint in activism prior to it, but I was so rebellious against, you know, oftentimes when you're younger, you're not really trying to hear what your parents have to say. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was kind of rebellious towards being a part of any type of cause, mm-hmm. you know, but um, it absolutely lit the fire because of the fact that, you know, I had these country white boys who had no problem calling me nigger and all these other derogatory statements and terms and, you know, just how it was work, how the, how the whole workforce was. I was uh, working inside of the prison I was receiving about three dollars and forty something cent every two weeks. Wow. So my check was three dollars and forty something cent every two wow. weeks. So I understood what slave labor was about. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I saw, I witnessed uh, what cl- capitalism was because of the fact that you had so many companies that were outsourcing to the prison. So here it was: you had folks who uh, maybe a Victoria's Secret, you know. Or like now, you know, folks like Apple or whatever who will outsource to the prison. Mm -hmm. And these inmates who are held captive, they're good enough to work inside of the camps. Mm -hmm. But they can't get a job, you know, with these same companies when they get out. So it's a a contradiction, Mm -hmm. you know. So um, it absolutely lit the fire. And, um, you know, I think that that was my greatest experience. And, you know, a lot of things, like you said, uh, I would go back and change, but you know, that experience was necessary. Um, so paint a picture for me where you're maybe South Carolina, maybe you're in Atlanta already. Um, what was the very first major um, circumstance or situation that you organized around? That I organized myself as an adult. I think that um, the very first, uh, man, I really can't, um, I would say, and, and again, you know, depending on what would be considered major, would it be major, you know, as far as the world knows about this particular case or just major to you. Major, major to me. I don't know if I would say major, but I would say important. I think one of the most important cases for me was probably in 2006 with the murder the police murder of 92 year old Captain Johnston, mm-hmm. who was gunned down uh, within a couple miles of where we sit now. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that was a very important case because of the fact that, you know, the folks in Atlanta in particular had the opportunity to see that, you know, it wasn't just, you know, you know, back in the day it was all about, you know, you had to be doing something. Police ain't just gonna shoot you. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Right. You know, what, what were they doing? You know, that was the, the old thing before social media, before mm-hmm. everybody had a cell phone. You know, it was mm-hmm. always, you know, blame the victim. Right. And here it is, this 92-year-old woman who never had a traffic ticket, you know, mm-hmm. who was murdered inside of her own home by police. And then they planted weed in her basement, planted mm-hmm. marijuana in her basement. Then they handcuffed her after they gunned her down. So she's dead, lying, leaking, bleeding. And... She's lying in handcuffs. And across the news, they talk about this uh, violent woman, this rogue individual who shot, fired shots at police officers. You know, but they didn't mention the fact that they ripped her burglar bars off her door and they came in unannounced and they came with hoodies and tin boots and, you know, and, and no sign of being police and they're in the middle of the hood. You know, so that was one of the most important cases. And I think from there would be the Troy Davis situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that was a case that, that, unlike the Captain Johnson case, 
Captain Johnson case was kind of knocked out because four days later you had the situation with Sean Bell mm -hmm. up in New York, mm -hmm. who was a groom about to be married, who was at his uh, uh, bachelor party. Bachelor yeah. party. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this happened like four days prior. Mm -hmm. So that was swept under the rug because the focus was on this, this poor groom, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. But the 92 year old, many folks had heard anything about that. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was an important situation. And of course, like I said, the Detroit Bulls situation where the brother down in uh, Savannah was accused of murdering a police officer and you know he was sentenced to death despite um, overwhelming evidence that uh, he wasn't even that he was not the shooter you know and, and, and a lack of evidence on the state's behalf you know nothing to, to, to put him at the scene and say that he did it you know so those were I know you asked for one but I think those were two mm -hmm. Of my two cases that I worked directly on, I think that was the most important. Yeah. So, um, from my recollection, your work with those particular cases has been documented most recently in um, your recently released documentary, Organizing is the New Cool. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, as far as the cases or the film itself? The film itself. Okay, Organizing is the New Cool is a film that. Uh, we started working on 13 years ago, and it was to document uh, the organization I started, the FTP movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our 15 years of work. We wanted to um, give a example of some of the, the community activities, some of the, the programs that exist, because we often hear our people who talk about what needs to be done. Black folks need to do this. Black folks need to do that. Is it? They're exempt. Like, right. You know, you know, I'm not black, so I'm just right. thinking about what you need to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So um, we wanted to highlight and document that, uh, which we did. And those cases were, you know, pretty, they were laid out pretty well. We got <clears throat> an idea of where we were headed and what it took to get us to where we got to. Um, but also, not only just documenting our work and efforts, <clears throat> but many of the efforts of OGs and elders who existed mm -hmm. before us. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many different brothers and sisters who put in work. We hear about the Malcolms, we hear about the Martins, mm -hmm. but there's never been a man or woman in history who didn't have a team. Right. You know what I mean? You can say Martin, he had the SCLC, mm -hmm. Malcolm, you know, he had the Nation of Islam and after he left the Nation of Islam, he had our uh, was a mosque incorporated and you had the organization for African Union. Mm -hmm. So we had a few different brothers, a couple of different brothers who had worked directly with them in organizing those particular uh, organizations or wow. entities. Um, aside from that, we had founders of the Black Panther Party. We have uh, founders of the Black Liberation Army, founders of the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM. Um, we have, uh, not only give away the film, but we have a number of different actors and uh, hip hop artists, mm -hmm. some who have transitioned and mm -hmm. some who are here with us now. So we wanted to show the world mm -hmm. some of their efforts and work. Again, like I said, it's the behind the scene workers mm -hmm. who usually put in the grunt work. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, a brother show pulled up in a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. Cadillac's beautiful, but the engine, the oil, you know what I mean? What's under the hood that, that, that made it possible for, for that Cadillac to cruise through. Right. Without right. the without the guts, it's just a shell. Exactly. You know, and that's what happens with our organization and that that's the importance. We want to highlight the brothers and sisters and the comrades who whose names are unknown, who don't get that recognition because they're the most important parts of the puzzle. You know, so yeah. that's kind of what organizing is really cool is I think about. All right. So speaking about behind the scenes um, you have a full on list of a bunch of different organizations that um, you have created or are part of. Um, can you tell us what, what all is going on within your complete list of um, organizations that you're a part of? Um, what their purpose is, um, all those sorts of things. Okay. 
again, I spoke about the FCP movement that was uh, the organization that started back in 2004. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the years, we have uh, united with a number of different organizations and we pretty much you know, merged mm -hmm. you know, organizations like the uh, African Martial Arts Institute, organizations like um, the Black Artist Organizing Club, or, um, Committee. Um, and more recently, we formed what we call the Seattle Movement. The Seattle Movement is an extension. And the Seattle Movement, the Seattle is an ant out of Kenya. It happens to be, happens to be our logo. Mm -hmm. But it's an ant out of Kenya, East Africa, um, that is a, it's, it's a blind ant that mm -hmm. grows to be an inch. But it's known for stripping down water buffaloes, ripping mm -hmm. things apart. But it, they're also known for building. Mm -hmm. Like you can't stand in the patch of these ants. I mean, they literally, I got the idea. I was watching the Discovery Channel one time and a frog hopped into a patch of siapples. And within 15 minutes, there was no um, evidence that that frog existed. Wow. You know, minus some bones or whatever. They ate them up, literally. Mm -hmm. You know, so the siapu, you know, we know that the ant is one of the most important creatures and one of the most overlooked creatures on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, no one cares about an ant. You know, you want to be a panther or a lion or a tiger, but mm -hmm. who wants to be an ant? A gorilla, you know, right. so, you know, an ant is, is, is humbling. So the siapu, we came up with the siapu movement and in the siapu movement, we have uh, community movement builders, which is our nonprofit wing. We have Mama's Army, we have the FTP movement, like I said, the African Martial Arts Institute. We have the National Coalition of Combat Against Terrorism. We have Freedom Home Academy, which is our educational component. We have um, uh, Seattle Youth Corps, which is our African Boys and Girl Scout program. Um, we have the Urban Survival Preparedness Institute mm -hmm. and a number of other different components that make up this, this one movement. Mm -hmm. And we call it a movement because of the fact that you know, the pieces are active. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, it's, it's been fashionable to hear folks talk about, get down by movement. And it's mm -hmm. like one person and they don't have anything going on. Right. And these are sisters and brothers who are dedicated and committed to our advancement. And these are brothers and sisters who, you know, are very creative. We have everything from artists to doctors and attorneys. You know, mm -hmm. we're not just a, a group of angry militants. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes, you know, they want to just uh, paint you up as, as Robert Williams talked about as niggas with guns. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We just want to, you know, whenever you talk about independence, whenever you talk about uh, being a strong African, when you talk about being against a system of oppression, you're looked at as some type of wild militant. You look at that as a crazy man. Like, well, they're just angry. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not angry. We are right. upset. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. We're upset at where we are, we're upset with how we've been treated and disregarded. Mm -hmm. So instead of us sitting back and complaining and just making some slick posts online, we get active. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we come together like ants in a colony. We form this formation and we build. You know what I mean? And we grow together. You know, and they say, you know, Che Guevara, the revolutionary, said the revolution is an act of love. You understand what I'm saying? So when you think of revolution, you can't point out a revolution where it's not about love. Even if your enemy is attacking you, it's the love for the people that will cause you to resist. Harriet Tubman was a revolutionary. She was an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She wasn't just some old lady that was walking folks through some underground tunnels. And, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So she got a page in the history book. Right. She was a freedom fighter. She had a gun. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She didn't just come with, a, with, a, with her uh, tambourine. Right. She just come with a church fan. You know what I mean? And that's not to knock anything, but, you know, uh, Jesus, when you talk about the concept of Jesus Christ, he was a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. He fought against uh, the government of his day. Mm -hmm. Pontius Pilate was like the Trump of his day. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, the Roman soldiers were the police of his day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And he was a victim of police terrorism because he was lynched. He was hung. He was hung on a cross. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? There was an execution. He was a Troy Davis of his time. And he was guilty of being a freedom fighter. He was guilty of feeding the poor. You know, mm -hmm. he came with the fish and the bread, the loaves, and he healed the blind. You know what I'm saying? And he, he 
he ran the money changers out of the temple. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is that that's a revolutionary. You understand what I'm saying? So we want, like Frederick Douglass said, we want the, the, the storms without the without the rain and without the light. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This will come with war. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And anybody who stands up, uh, who dares to stand up against oppression in America is deemed some type of terrorist or outlaw. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Yes, you have to get rid of them. And that's pretty much what they've been attempting to do for so many years. So we, the Siafu movement, you know, uh, Marcus Garvey, when he was locked up in Atlanta, at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, a reporter rode up on him. He was laughing at him, mocking him. And he said, uh, Mr. Garvey, uh, they got you. What you going to do now? He said, uh, you may have the lion in the cage, but I left many cubs in the bush. We're those cubs in the bush, and we constantly grow. So that's what this thing is about. You know what I mean? It is, it is homage to those who uh, came before us, our ancestors who were bold enough, who were brave enough to fight uh, slavery, to resist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To, to not just, you know, our job here is to not just brag about how many pyramids we built and all this other nonsense. Well, damn well, we didn't lift one brick, but we built right. pyramids. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Our job is to continue that work, and that's what we're doing. Gotcha. So with all of this work that you've done, all of the individuals that you have come across over the years, um, what sort of a role have you seen mental health play in the lives of just the, the Black community overall? Right. I think that mental health is is, is tantamount. I think it is, uh, it is important. It's, it's crazy because in the Black community, we have... We need healing more than anyone else mm -hmm. because we're, we, we've experienced all types of trauma. We can, can, we've experienced uh, post-traumatic slave disorder. Sure. You know what I mean? Gotcha. You talk about, uh, I read a report, there was a uh, woman who was talking about how the uh, Jewish folks in the, during the Holocaust, how many of their offspring were suffering different traumas. Mm -hmm. And, and we already know that, that, that that's like with us, we are suffering, you know, from, mm -hmm. from slavery. So we still carry, that's in our DNA, yeah. you know, the pain and the, the, the hurt mm -hmm. and the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the, the lack of love and the disregard, all of that is embedded within our DNA, it's in our melanin. It's mm -hmm. just like America, you know, violence is embedded inside of the fiber of America. You know, uh, this trauma is embedded within us, just like our melanin. So I think that it's important, but unfortunately, we've been taught that when you go seek help, mm -hmm. it's looked at as a sign of weakness. Yes, it is. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, it Folks is. are embarrassed. We're so damaged, we're so Americanized that we laugh when our people are in pain. We see somebody get shot on TV. Oh, it looks funny, got shot in the butt. You see somebody walking down the street, uh, talking to themselves, Mitch man, I'm like, ooh, crazy, look at him jumping up and down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, a folk, someone who was a victim of uh, chemical and biological warfare, a quote-unquote crackhead or dope fiend, we laugh because they're trying to sell the broken TV or something like that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? They're victims. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that it, it's, it's very important for um, us all to seek some type of therapy. A friend of mine, Ekin Dyer, he's a rap artist out here, he had a song called, uh, and in the song he said, the world is sick, we need therapy. Mm -hmm. We all need therapy. You know what I'm saying? If you're not getting therapy, some type of therapy, then to a great extent you're a veteran. Mm -hmm. Right, so at this point now, what else is, what, what else can we look out for? What else is coming next? What else can we look out for? Um, revolution. Uh, <laughs> I think that, um, I think that we can look for us to continue to uh, purchase land, continue to grow food, continue us, continue to uh, you know build black families, to continue to build institutions, mm -hmm. uh, educate ourselves. Um, you know, we are we are about nation building. You you hear the term nation building is one of those terms that have been thrown around so loosely that you mm -hmm. just think that oh we nation building, cat ain't got a. A, a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. 
yeah. the nation would. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So our thing is uh, being proactive, you know, um, show and prove, as they say, mm-hmm. you know. So um, what you can look out for is uh, some intelligent Africans <clears throat> who, are, who are building and striving, you know, whether it's on from the local politics, because we're running brothers and sisters, you know, for office on a local level. Mm-hmm. We don't believe in electoral politics, but on a local level, we know that, you know, if we have uh, our sister sitting in the front of city council board, mm-hmm. can make that phone call and say, look, we're trying to do this thing over here. You skip through the red tape. Right. You understand right. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that's what we talk about black power, but we don't understand power. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. we're after the power. That's what we want. All right. That's what you can expect. We have to get out of our little cubby holes. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times folks talk about we preach it to the choir, but sometimes the choir don't even know the hymn. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the dancer don't know the sermon. <laughs> so uh, instead of us just making a joyful noise, mm-hmm. we want to make sure that uh, we're proactive. So uh, we're doing this sister-led event mm-hmm. because it's important. You know, you know from being around the community that oftentimes the brothers, you know, we have, we're the voice. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we need to shut up, but we're, we're usually the voices. Mm-hmm. But any intelligent people know that there's some systems behind us that's helping us to, you know, to push that thing along. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. most systems aren't at the forefront. So mm-hmm. with this particular piece, I think that probably about 95% of the speakers, teachers, and um, you know, folks who are uh, helping to put it together with these systems. You know, so we want to invoke that that uh, invoke that uh, spirit of Harriet Tubman and uh, you know, show folks what folks what Harriet Tubman is about. But the whole block party concept, that particular piece, is to draw other people. We want to draw the neighbors. Uh-huh. We always do these events in neighborhoods, but we never invite the neighbors. Right. How crazy right. is that? We got all this stuff going on, neighbors all around us. They don't know what the hell is going on. It's like, well, mm-hmm. some black folks doing such and such. They yeah. black. You know, mm-hmm. We overlook them because they don't dress like us. They don't look like us. So we want to really draw, you know, the masses. All right. All right. So any last words, any um, words of encouragement or... Um, Anything in particular that you would like to leave our um, viewers with? Yeah. um, You have to get prepared. Uh, We're in a crisis. You know, white supremacy is at an all-time high. We've been at war for 400 years. We've been victims of white supremacy. We've been victims of mass murders and mass shootings and all that for 400 years. So we're hit for that. But we have to prepare ourselves, you know. Survival, preparedness, learn how to grow food. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm not going to say unify because that's such a loose word. Mm-hmm. Everybody runs from it. Black folks just need to stick together. We're sticking together in the cemeteries. We're sticking together in the clubs. We're sticking together in the jail cell. So it's more than us just sticking together. Mm-hmm. But we have to um, join an organization. Mm-hmm. Individualism, there's no place for individualism right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're not a part of some type of an organization, I don't care what you want to call it. I don't care who the leader is, none of that type of stuff. That's your own personal business. But you have to be a part of something, you know, that you can purchase food together. You can't do nothing but buy toilet paper together. Mm-hmm. Everybody got to wipe their tail. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. Can you buy some toilet paper together? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Can you support black folks that support you? Not just mm-hmm. buy black, but buy black from folks who are, who are supporting black. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, we say, like I said, survival preparedness, which includes martial arts, firearm trainings. Um, we're in the South. Gun laws are lax. You know, go to the range. Mm-hmm. Those dates, instead of taking your girl to the club, take her to the range. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Teach her how to shoot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or teach your man how to shoot in some case. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so it's about those things. And uh, like I said, grow food, uh, survival preparedness. And um, we got to get that, get the finances up. Yes. We've been taught to be poor, righteous teachers for so long and taught about how we in the struggle. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in struggling. 
Abs- I absolutely agree with that. About our people's liberation. That's a struggle. That's, you know, we, we not busy enough struggle. Mm-hmm. You know what I, mean? I agree. We in the struggle, man. You in the struggle. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's been crazy. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that, that's what I would say. All right. So, if anybody wanted to follow up on your works or um, check out what's coming up next, how can they get in contact with you? We have uh, a few different websites. Um, we have the Siafu Movement. It's S I A F U Movement. Dot org. We have um, our film organizing is the new cool dot com. Organizing is the new cool dot com. We have our podcast, which is renegade culture dot com. It's renegade culture dot com. Um, those are the main ways. And of course, you can find us on social media Twitter, Facebook, Instagram for the time being. All right. And one last question. Uh, organizing is the new cool. Um, where will you all be showing um, the film next? Okay, right now we are gearing up for film festivals. Right. Um, we w- we're doing uh, screenings and film festivals where uh, we don't just want to put out a DVD to go on a table or to serve the black community. A lot of times we get the, the conscious DVDs and you know they're in all the conscious spots and all that. You know, we want to reach further because our work goes big, it goes further than just the quote unquote conscious community. In fact, most of our constituents and the folks that we serve have absolutely nothing to do with quote unquote conscious community. Mm-hmm. In fact, our membership, the brothers and sisters who got down with what we did or do, is made up of everyday brothers and sisters mm-hmm. who wanted to do something. They're like, look, folks are homeless, they got a feed the people program, how can I make some sandwiches? Cool. Um, police beating up my neighbor, whatever they put together a uh, community patrol, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, you know, there's something for everybody mm-hmm. besides us just talking tough and selling wolf tickets. Gotcha. All right, well, I'd like, definitely would like to thank you for um, coming on for an interview and I wish you the best. Thank you. And I appreciate, um, you know, this fine publication for, you know, being able to um, reach folks, you know, Everyday people. For sure.